biotechnology and genetics in aquaculture. It's a main uh, driving force in the blue economy, aquaculture, and also biotechnology and genetics. You can uh, almost address everything in the whole value chain with those technologies. And there is a dynamic development in these technologies from the restriction enzymes in the 70s up to now with the whole genome sequencing, a functional genomics, synthetic biology, you can address everything from genetic refinement and breeding, traceability, food safety, biorefinery techniques, and aquaculture and technology is not just in a vacuum. We, it's working best when we create a vibrant uh, environment and ecosystem around it. The technology is invented by people and employed by people. I was very inspired by these uh, morning sessions when I learned uh, and confirmed my very interesting dialogue I had with uh, His uh, Royal Highness that the oceans, the aquatic environments and the oceans, they can address almost all challenges of mankind. And the aquaculture session we are discussing today with the employment of the state-of-the-art technology is also very interdependent of the whole marine system. We cannot just discuss aquaculture on its own. It's part of a whole. Feed systems, ingredients also coming from the ocean, and there is an intimate interaction. I also had very uh, inspired, quite inspired by the visit to Norway and discussion with uh, Clara Nunes dos Santos, the ambassador to Norway, and uh, that we already are into a very interesting dialogue how to strengthen the, the uh, collaboration between these two countries. And uh, I feel uh, almost at home when I'm here in uh, Portugal, the gateway to the new bio, blue bioeconomy. So uh, let me now start with uh, introducing the excellent panel here. They are going to introduce us to how we implement this fantastic uh, science and technology into the real, uh, real uh, systems. And, um, why don't you start uh, introducing yourself? Good morning. Um, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. My name is uh, Veronica McGuire, and I'm delighted to be a participant in this year's convention, building on participation in a uh, biomarine convention that took place in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia last year. Uh, I am with the Canadian uh, Food Inspection Agency, uh, a regulator, the largest uh, science-based regulator in Canada. We are responsible for regulating food safety as well as animal and uh, plant health. My uh, particular area of responsibility is developing uh, policies and approaches around uh, regulatory practices at the uh, CFIA as well as some of our modernization uh, initiatives. I'm also responsible for trade policy from uh, food safety, animal health, and plant health uh, point of view. Uh, so I hope I can bring uh, a regulatory uh, perspective, uh, not only in a Canadian context, but in an international context, and uh, that those perspectives will in inform some of the debate uh, today as well as tomorrow. Thank you, Veronica. And then, Odd Magne. Thank you. Uh, my name is Odd Magne Rötzet. I'm a group director aquaculture in a German holding group called EW Group. Um, we are mainly involved in three business areas. It's breeding and genetics that by far is the most important, but also in animal health and nutrition. Uh, the group today contains approximately 80 companies with 7,000 employees. Um, 
to try very short to, to, to summarize my professional career, it's quite easy. I've been 10 years in academia, uh, working with fish immunology. After that, 10 years in, in veterinary pharmaceutical company, working with fish develop, no, sorry, vaccine development, and then as a CEO in Aquagy, and that's a, a salmon genetic company. So the last three years, I tried to convince my German colleagues that um, the solution to some of the major challenges is, uh, as well as many business opportunities, are now in the ocean and not anymore in terrestrial systems. Thank you. Then the voice from the great uh, oceanic Mozambique. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Claudio Baule, and um, uh, my current position is a coordinator of the uh, Biotechnology and Biosciences Hub in uh, uh, technology park that is uh, newly built in Mozambique. It's uh, located like 60 kilometers up of, uh, north of Maputo. And the um, establishment of this Biotechnology and Bioscience Hub came exactly uh, from the recognition that it is important to have a space where science and business issues could come together in biotechnology to be able to uh, drive different initiatives and also to take advantages of all the good potentialities that we have there, uh, that we see as opportunities. So to be able to harness those opportunities, we have to do something about it, and starting from establishing the science business connection in this science and technology park. Uh, this is a bit away from my traditional background as a scientist who's been mostly involved with uh, characterizing microbes, developing tools from uh, um, learning of microbes and uh, also from uh, um, investigating different um, uh, mechanisms of uh, how viruses in particular cause diseases and this kind of things all based on molecular tools. So I thought that it would be better to accept a challenge where I could uh, try to catalyze changes instead of being, you know, another scientist running after gr grants and <laughs> uh, being frustrated because, uh, yeah, it gets more and more difficult to do science the traditional ways nowadays. So, trying to find a new uh, paradigm of doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And then, George. George Yetias. Thank you and good morning, everybody. I am one of the co-founders of Sparus. It is a startup company, a Portuguese startup company that was uh, initiated in a research center in the south of Portugal. We have been always involved in the aquaculture business and we are here today because we are somehow end users of any developments that biotech or genetics could be contributing to the development of aquaculture. So, as I said, Sparus is a, a, a technology-driven SME which is dedicated to the development of new products but also tailored nutritional solutions for the aquaculture industry. Uh, and I would try here to bring a little bit our experience and our perspective on some of the mechanisms that would foster this transfer of technology because sometimes biotech the developments are done at the university level or in the academia and I would like to bring our experience on how we could transform this into an industrial application. We have been discussing this morning this uh, very interesting uh, timely uh, coincidence of necessities and opportunities and uh, I think the a major driver in, in uh, innovation is uh, to have challenges. You become quite, quite creative. It's part of uh, mankind's nature. But you need to also facilitate. And it was very interesting reading the economist have, uh, the other day. They were discussing uh, extensively the uh, world economies, struggling and tumbling. And they were discussing uh, almost yesterday economies. And new solutions were building a lot of uh, constructions and roads and buildings. And that is, of course, important. But then they never pointed to this new opportunity. This is a new economy we are talking about now. A big thing. And a sustainable thing. Moving from the unsustainable and non-renewable to the bio-based economy. Fantastic potentials. So I think the next paper in 
the economist should be written by maybe this panel here, or, uh, or you, or some of you. This is very important, that they, and I was really inspired at this morning session. They were pointing at uh, this is not just uh, big challenges for mankind in, 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 in terms of food supply, climate change, uh, lifestyle diseases, energy, but they also about establishing and make, paving the way for a new economy. That is also part of it. But everything is made by mankind. So back to the, this is not a talk by me, this, no, back to the excellent panel. So we, we thought it would make sense to really discuss technology and science in, into a context here. So we want to start off with, uh, with Veronica on, uh, on uh, is there anything we could do on uh, harmonizing international common instruments uh, on uh, legalistics and uh, regulatory framework, uh, human resources, finance, etc. We've already heard this morning uh, several times about the importance of uh, globalization and the impact of uh, global trends, also the importance of uh, international cooperation across borders. Uh, certainly that's a, a consideration in the regulatory environment and has been for a number of years. Heightened attention has been paid to international regulatory cooperation, particularly since the global crisis in 2008. It uh, underscored the importance of, uh, of that collaboration and recognized institutions like the OECD have been playing a more active role in developing guidance uh, to countries on how to collaborate, the types of mechanisms that uh, should be explored, their cost as well as their benefits. So certainly from a Canadian perspective, uh, we are uh, pursuing opportunities and will continue to pursue these opportunities to um, uh, achieve more cooperation and harmonization or alignment at uh, the international level. As part of our uh, food safety reforms, we are exploring uh, what's commonly referred to as uh, mutual syst uh, uh, system recognition, which is a, a, pro a process whereby regulators in, uh, in countries will uh, share information about uh, their systems approach and their safety outcomes with the goal of achieving uh, equivalency type of agreements. We've been very active working with our major trading partner, the United States, uh, in exploring uh, mutual uh, agreements and are close to finalizing uh, uh, this type of agreement in the context of food safety. And that will enable us to more readily share information as well as um, facilitate and streamline pro product reviews uh, and approvals. Bearing in mind that the rules in each country may be different, but the outcomes that we seek to achieve uh, are essentially equivalent. And along those lines, we're also pursuing with the United States an initiative uh, which is characterized as the Regulatory Cooperation Council. And there are a number of components and sectors involved in, in that process. In the most recent round of consultations between Canada and the United States, aquaculture has emerged as a, a priority for regulatory cooperation and alignment. And, Industry, both in Canada and the United States, has, have been active in that process uh, and will be expected to uh, remain active contributors uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the approaches that might be put in place uh, to facilitate uh, regulatory decision making and our approach to risk management. The other thing that I'll mention, uh, uh, because there are quite a number of uh, trends that I could point to, is one that is emerging in, in the food sector, and that's the evolution of private certification schemes. Uh, these are uh, arrangements or schemes that are industry-driven, 
but are important from a regulatory point of view. Uh, they're not rules or regulations, and they will not be a substitute for regulatory oversight. But having said that, in situations where we have private certification schemes recognized at the international level that are science-based and have a, a discipline approach uh, to which industry or um, uh, producers uh, uh, adhere to and reach those standards, it will influence uh, the regulatory oversight because more and more we are basing our approaches on risk and the general philosophy is that where private cert certification schemes are in place and there's already monitoring by industry, the role of government uh, is adjusted accordingly. Thank you, Veronica. What more now? Just, just a comment. That I think one lesson we have already learned on this convention, and I think it's important to underline and, and communicate that the implementation of the bioeconomy is challenge-driven rather than technology-driven. I think that's, that's important, and it's much easier for the public and other stakeholders to, to, to be engaged, to take ownership in the process, to identify themselves and to accept the technology if we, if we focus on the challenging. And in this landscape, I think for sure authorities and regulation has, has an important role to play uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, create a win-win uh, environment for in industry, investors, as well as society. Uh, and to be honest, I'm, I'm not that concerned about the R&D part of the bioeconomy value chain, if you want. I'm much more concerned about trying to find an optimal system to facilitate the transition from the research lab to the marketplace. That that's will be our biggest challenges. And, and from the industry part to the regulators, I, I just ask for <laughs> many things, but among them is, is stability and predictability. I think that's the, the prerequisite for all investors to, to put their money in the sector. The other thing, which I, I know it's a mission impossible, uh, and, and I see the conflict, and, and that is that the, the speed of development of research as well as technology in, the, in, in what we see the pace that's happening there, the regulators very soon become up, outdated and turns into a barrier, barrier against innovation as well as market expansion and end of the day discourage investments. So, so, so I, I see the problem, but, uh, but this is something we have to, to, to really uh, 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 fight to, to be updated on. There, there is a trade-off here and also there is a new trend actually where you, you, you make the players responsible for also be part of developing standards. Mm. Uh, 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 Sector-specific standards, even, even business-specific standards. And there is, so, there is something called a social license. I mean, you, you make a framework and then you leave the room to find sustainable, creative solutions within the framework. That is, a, I think, is a good way to collaborate with, between the players and the... What do you think, uh, Veronica, before we... A few comments also, yeah. Um, sure. Uh, well, first you like of all, that? Uh, let me uh, <laughs> respond to, uh, to some of the points that my colleague raised. Uh, there's no question that predictability is a, is a key consideration. We hear that from uh, domestic industry uh, in Canada and other stakeholders as well as uh, international partners. So we um, are working, uh, continue to work to ensure that uh, our, uh, our regulations uh, are clear, uh, the requirements uh, are um, spelled out and uh, that there are no surprises for, for industry and for others. Uh, it sounds easy, it's not, um, but uh, it's certainly a key consideration along with transparency, which uh, I think is also, we've heard as a very strong message from stakeholders is understanding how the regulatory process works, how decisions are, are made. The, our decisions are based on science, uh, but uh, uh, typically industry as well as consumers and other stakeholders are, uh, have an appetite for um, 
more information and more transparency uh, around our decision making. Keeping pace with science is a challenge. Uh, regulations uh, typically uh, move slowly uh, in the Canadian experience. Uh, we like to think that uh, uh, the outcome that we achieve is uh, often or should be oriented around science and uh, really protecting the, the health and safety of, uh, of people and, and animals and the environment. But uh, I wouldn't want to suggest that that's necessarily an expedited uh, process. Again, we're looking at more modern ways of doing our business so that we can better keep pace with science. The issue of social li license is one that we're discussing uh, with industry and policymakers in Canada. I'm sure it's happening in, in some of your countries as well. And that's really around the, the challenge of building trust and it's not a, a science or a rules-based discussion, it's, it's values-based because consumers, for example, are asking more and more questions about not only uh, the uh, price of the product but uh, the methods of production, animal welfare consideration, um, whether uh, there's uh, biotechnology or GMOs in, involved and all those are important considerations. The debate is really what role does industry play vis-a-vis -vis the role of government. I think where we can all agree is that it is a collective uh, effort if we're, if we're to be successful. Thank you. We, we need to move quickly over to the science and technology and innovation systems but before we move maybe a few Quick comment from the from George or uh, Claudia. Thank you. I would just um, um, like to add one more angle to the questions that uh, or the issue that uh, um, <laughs> we discuss is um, uh, basically that uh, along with the um, uh, drafting of all the uh, regulation that there should be a um, way to disseminate this regulation to different stakeholders so that they kind of understand what, the, what it's all about and how we can serve them in different capacities. We're like talking about the researchers, or the, uh, about companies, about decision makers, about um, um, if we talk about side of the world even uh, from the political point of view. It's really important that uh, all these issues are very well understood. Then the second is that countries like ours who are at the very beginning or the very first steps of embracing biotechnology and marine biotechnology in particular, uh, it would be important to draw uh, from all the experiences that uh, exist uh, from countries that have gone a long way to uh, draft regulation in the sense of uh, adopting what is um, um, uh, suitable and what can be uh, used from those um, um, uh, regulatory frameworks that exist and make them uh, naturally applicable to the local conditions, but that it's a good step for, um, for the whole community, I would say, that uh, large effort has been made by countries like Canada and the US and a lot of countries in Europe as well. We can learn a lot from that. Thank you. A few good points there, thank you. And uh, George? Yes, I will be very uh, synthetic on this because a lot has already been said, but I totally agree when, with the idea that we, we are addressing challenges. And that's what we should in somehow also communicate because in some ways the consumer or uh, the, the, the general public is in, in some context, a lack of information of the challenges that lay ahead of our society in a series of areas. And when we see the scarcity of resources that will, avail, will be available to fuel, for instance, we talked about aquaculture growth, but nobody knows how to fuel that growth because if we do it with the tools or with the practices that we are doing right now, we will totally face a wall of it's not sustainable to do with the current practices. So new solutions will have to come, but we have to think about all these challenges in an integrated way because it comes not only from the byproducts that we saw uh, uh, in the prior panel, but also in better or more efficient animals that we are discussing here. So all this has to be integrated. Then we move into 
challenges and opportunities and technology and science uh, proposed solutions. So, Ad Magne, could you uh, take us through some uh, thoughts? Yeah, I, can, I can try at least. I, I, I just review the last FAO figures and the World Bank figures on the estimation. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the, the, the 2012 production globally was a, a little bit under 70 million uh, uh, tons uh, globally. Uh, within 15 years, we will reach close to 100 million, according to, or that means 95 million uh, tons, according to the World Bank. So, so we are talking about, we are not only trying to solve challenges from the past, but we are going into an intensification of the, of the production and probably uh, new, new challenges as well if we are going to, to meet the, the prognosis of the World Bank. So, so, and I really think that Blue Biotech has lots to offer when it comes to, to solutions. Uh, I would like to draw your attention on three three areas. Point one that I think is the major challenge. Point one is the loss in production. I think most of the industry are suffering from too much losses during production. The salmonids, 20-30% of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the seeds do never reach the, the slaughtering bank. The same for the shrimp industry. We know huge disease problems in, in Asia. Uh, so, so there is, 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 is lots to be done. And the losses, one thing is, of course, the primary consequences, the financial loss for the farmer. But there is lots of secondary effect connected to animal welfare, consumption of antibiotics, food safety, bacterial resistance, and things like that. So I think fish or vaccine development has been a tremendous success in the salmon industry. We have heard that a thousand times, but again, still this technology is based on very old platforms. It's crude bacterines, it's oil formulated uh, uh, solution, which means you have to inject the vaccines. So, so and we still lack vaccines against a huge number of important diseases. So it's, it's, I, I think it's a kind of disappointed if there is something, somebody from the pharmaceutical industry that we haven't been able to, to bring in new technologies in order to target these important uh, diseases. Uh, I would say priorities, one within the vaccine development are we have to find new delivery systems and hopefully the regulators allow the industry to use live attenuated technologies. That's the only way we can target uh, intracellular bacteria and viruses. Uh, another in interesting issue, I think, uh, that has come up lately, uh, also uh, connected to, to loss in production, is that it seems that more genome-based technologies within breeding can really develop highly resistant animals. And now lots of how shall I say, pre-competitive tools are available. The whole salmon genome is available. Everybody can, can find it and, and use it, and we see more and more species coming there. We have a much richer and, importantly, much cheaper toolbox that can be used both to find the markers or the genes and to implement uh, high-throughput testing. So genomic-based technology seems to offer a quite interesting tool in order to develop more uh, robust and resistant animals. Secondly, I would draw the attention to the environmental uh, impact. We all know stories of the mangrove in, in, in shrimp production, the Mekong Delta and the Pangasius, Norway and Chile, a salmon production that has push the industry beyond the carrying capacity of the environment, and they, we are punished immediately. So, so, so that's, that's part one. Uh, in the salmon industry where I'm mostly uh, involved, we have different issues, but one of them as, is the interaction with the wild strains, and, and especially genetic interaction based on SKPs, SKP from, from the industry. And, Again, biotechnology, I think, have lots to offer in order to develop sterile animal uh, of different technologies available uh, that can solve that. Uh, last but not at least, the nutrition. Uh, I'm one of those who 
honestly believe to domesticate and farm a carnivore is not a very good idea. But okay, we have salmonids, we have bass bream in, in, in Mediterranean. Uh, and, and, and if you see in the history, the last 10 years, the increase in aquaculture has been 70%. And in spite of the fact that the supply from fish meal has been reduced by 15. So, so, so that means that uh, the industry is able to circumvent this issue, but still, and especially for the European industry, it's of utmost importance that we are able to find alternative sources of both, especially the lipid, lipid part, but also the meal part. Very important the sustainability is issue this discussed to almost all conferences, the feedstock, the availability of, of feed uh, resources, and also critical ingredients. So, George and Claudia. Yeah. Joe, yeah. I, okay. I would just uh, add up to this last uh, part, which is the part also where I feel more comfortable as a fish nutritionist, uh, which is we are really making, or oh, it is time that we make our choices also, because we know that resources are scarce, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, we are all promoting as one of the advantages of fish as a healthy food for the consumer, but at the same time we know that they have limited resources for, for, for supplying that. When we talked about aquaculture growth, we know that in fresh water it will be difficult in the future, so we will have to go to the marine environment to make this aquaculture growth explode as it, it is expected to do. But one thing people don't know is that marine fish require these omega-3 fatty acids. They are essential. And this essential means that they cannot live without. So we have to put in the diets that they eat. But we don't have enough. So we either have to find ways of generating, and we have here also, we will have panels on microalgae and all these elements that could be a source of these fatty acids, but as, as it was said, we also have the tools now to approach and try to improve fish efficiency in using these fatty acids, in synthesizing a capacity that is there. We are not talking about transgenics, huh? we are talking about they have that capacity, but it is a poor capacity. And if we can, with biotechnology tools, unlock that potential, then we are opening new avenues for, 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 for the industry to grow. The same thing with a very scarce resource, which is phosphorus. Most people don't know, but within this century, phosphorus will somehow peak and we will reach the, the over half the limits of the world in terms of resources. We are now using these alternative ingredients, plant ingredients. There is phosphorus there, but fish and most monogastic animals cannot digest it. So we have to find tools and biotechnology again is unlocking that potential so that these animals can digest that phosphorus that otherwise is being at this moment just going into the sea and is a pollution source. These Good. are two examples of something that biotechnology will clearly bring a benefit to the industry. Very good points. We should have a vision, uh, no human uh, food for animal feed and fish. And we can use also state-of-the-art uh, biorefinery techniques to attack uh, non-human food. Claudia. Uh, basically, add up that uh, along with w uh, what has been said, um, we could add an element of um, uh, environmental sustainability into all these um, uh, aspects. What biotechnology can do to safeguard <coughs> that uh, all the, the environment that is as it's used for aquaculture does not um, end up being uh, terribly affected or that we have to deal with problems of uh, degradation or um, uh, issues like bad management of systems that end up uh, bringing us back to where we started, so to say. So um, all the sorts of tools that exist there can be um, uh, kind of explored to uh, devise, let's say, markers to monitor uh, uh, questions of uh, issues of uh, pollution. Uh, look at uh, uh, what aquaculture is doing to local biodiversity, for instance, the effect of escapees and uh, these kind of things. And then there is uh, um, a whole issue of um, uh, taking more advantage of the extreme biodiversity that is in terrestrial and marine environments a little bit everywhere.
genetics can do a lot on that, as it has been said. Thank you. Before we move into the sort of final part with the very important collaborative efforts between developing and industrial countries and also consumer power, we, we need to discuss very briefly on this what, what kind of, uh, how can we optimize the, uh, the private public uh, partnership in, in uh, facilitating innovation? Because we cannot innovate on our own, we, we need to sort of make an ecosystem for innovation with the all kind of sort of uh, intellectual and material uh, infrastructure. But the, ma the main thing is the human resource. So George, uh, do you have any opinion on how to leverage uh, innovation, private-public partnership? Yes, somehow we, we, we are an example of this uh, starting up from the university and going into the private, uh, uh, as a private company. And I would say, that one of the, the elements that I think was at the basis of why Sparos was created was the fact that I was uh, working in academia, I went to work uh, in the industry for, for some years, and then I came back to academia. I, and I didn't come back as the same person. And that gave me a perception, of course I'm talking about the Portuguese uh, uh, reality. I cannot generalize to other countries, but to our reality, the fact that I had worked in a, a, a large company and then came back, it gave me the perception on a different ways of doing research. This doesn't mean that the rest is incorrect. It, it has places for everything, but I could not no longer do in the same way, because in somehow I had shared a vision with a more industrial perspective of research and development. And that thing, to me, I tried to, to see it, that it could be implemented in our Portuguese reality, what we, we have called it, uh, uh, reinforce the mechanisms that could foster this working mobility. Researchers from the academia should be able to go and work in the industry and then come back if they wanted. We should have instruments. Uh, I, 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 on that respect, in terms of uh, labor laws and all that, I'm no expert to really say the <coughs> models that we should do. But it would be great if we could have staff exchanges, sabbaticals, where people from the university, when they think about sabbaticals, probably in 99% they think about going to another university. In Portugal, there is no this tendency to go and work for two years in, a, in an industry and then come back. We don't, probably the legal framework does not allow it. So that's a barrier that exists. But if we could find these mechanisms, I think that it would be great. Uh, uh, <clears throat> by empiria and experience, the clusters seem to be like, uh, either they develop on their own or they are, we help them to develop. There is some very sort of inbuilt power they, there is, uh, could be tough competition, but at the same time, they, they, they uh, interact in a very uh, dynamic way. Solution providers, producers, capital owners, uh, it's, uh, and academia, and, and it's all about human resources anyway. So is there anything about uh, our willingness to facilitate cluster politics, cluster policy? Is just a final comment from the panel. Any of you? Yeah, I, I agree. Of course, I mean, clusters have worked in other sectors and will for sure work in biotechnology as well. Huh? Uh, but I, I think it's important to concentrate our efforts. Don't smear it thin around. Huh? We, we need a critical mass in each cluster. So after a while, and it should be initial a public-private initiative, but it has to mature and be self-sustained. Then you have to, to really to, to, to concentrate efforts. I think also the last session was important. I also have been in academia, uh, into the private, never were able to return again, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, but uh, the most, let's say, the most underestimated hurdle when it comes to, from the lab bench to the industry is scale. Uh, it's an underestimation of, of, of the, uh, what has to be done in order to get it from the Epidorf uh, tube to a fermenter. So, so the, the pilot plant, uh, demonstration plant, 
uh, topics that was discussed last session as a private public initiative extremely important. Mm. The last part is of course uh, that I would like to mention is, is the early, early phase investment. Uh, company do not invest in, in early phase. It's too risky. Uh, so, so, so that's where also the public has to contribute to, to bring it, uh, to, to help it uh, some way. So time is uh, flying and running and uh, moving. So uh, we, we have, uh, we have yeah. still a very important issue to discuss in a few minutes, the, the industrial versus uh, developing countries. But um, a few seconds. It was just to mention exactly that, because we at Sparus, one of our main differences, let's say, is that we built a pilot-scale facility. We could not do it as a big industry, but we made that jump by generating okay. a pilot, uh, in this case, a pilot-scale feed mill. And that is being proved to be really a, a huge need from both the academia and from the big industry that also wants to come and test. And that's a little bit, it comes and reinforces that concept that we are missing, in some cases, uh, pilot scale capacity, at least in our reality here in southern part of Europe, I would say. We need to fill in all the holes in the ecosystem, and we need to respect each other with different agendas and different needs and incentives. Uh, then back to a very important uh, the untapped potentials, what kind of buttons could we push, uh, Claudia, on uh, developing versus industrial country uh, collaboration with also employing to the maximum uh, our good uh, toolboxes? Uh, I will start with um, a very common constatation that we have in our brainstormings, I would say, mostly from my experience with working in Southern Africa. We have all these uh, networks that somehow are connected with uh, aquaculture or biotechnology in general that deal also with marine biotechnology. And one of the issues that uh, come when we discuss is that, uh, okay, Africa obviously has a lot of resources, be it terrestrial resources, be it marine resources, I mean, the richness is there. Uh, in a way, uh, the, the conclusion is that uh, nature has provided, so it has provided the, 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 the basic uh, uh, resources that could help to uh, deal with uh, hunger problems, could help with combating um, malnutrition, as we've been um, uh, mentioning many times, from uh, food production, be it through aquaculture or through other uh, applications, uh, can help to find uh, solutions for diseases, and the biodiversity can also contribute to uh, sustain the environment with uh, a myriad of uh, solutions. Um, the industry can benefit a lot from the um, uh, transformation of those bioresources, but still, um, in the whole, we lag far much behind uh, what should be in normal situation. And the way we look at it is that, okay, nature has provided, this is a blessing, uh, but it's a blessing that comes with a responsibility. And we see our role as, um, in, in that responsibility, and when we say, uh, say us, it's uh, the researchers with whom we've been discussing, companies, uh, decision makers sometimes, when uh, uh, it's possible to engage them in the discussions, uh, students, so this whole uh, community has really uh, a responsibility to take on uh, uh, what is needed to, to, to to harness the potential of these resources in the benefit of mankind. Uh, when I say uh, it would be possible to solve uh, food problems, not just for Africa, but for the whole uh, world, it's really true because the potential is there. So when we go zoom into what are the problems, why this, this is not happening, of course there are a lot of different factors. But the ones that uh, uh, we, in environments like this, can control are, for instance, the technological gap that exists between uh, developing and developed countries. And this technological gap could, for instance, be addressed by deploying technologies that can work on, on settings of developing countries so that uh, uh, some of the problems are solved and uh, uh, production is increased, uh, jobs are created, industries are started, companies are built, and, and, and also forth. And when we talk about um, uh, deploying te technologies, we don't necessarily mean that uh, you know, a technology that is uh, established in Switzerland will work well in a, a country like Mozambique. You know, it's nothing like that. But 
Uh, what we mean is that um, the, the, the people who have, done, who have gone steps ahead uh, looking and developing technologies can help our settings to see how to best, uh, which is the best way to fast go through the de uh, technological development process, even if it means coming with uh, new technologies, and this represents also an opportunity. Uh, the other one is scientific collaboration, of course, and scientific collaboration can go through from running joint projects to uh, co-development co -development, uh, of products, can come from uh, uh, fostering companies, can come from uh, companies from um, uh, developing uh, countries or developed countries establishing themselves in, uh, in the developing world and all sorts of win-win agreements that can come and that can help to make this go faster. And of course it's necessary to have an enabling environment for this, otherwise it will not work so easily. And there comes the political will, there comes the funding instruments, there comes the uh, regulations like we will be talking because uh, you know, business people who invest in a, in a place want to know that their business is safe, that there is draws, that there is uh, uh, regulation, that things work fine, that uh, uh, the fiscal environment is uh, right, is appropriate. So all those things uh, could need to be taken into consideration. But it's really important that uh, uh, the scientific collaboration is uh, starting, for instance, because it's going to drive all those things to come, you know, as a consequence, so to say. Um, and then the, the, the other part has to be to, to deal with all the um, way of viewing uh, the interactions between developing countries and develop, uh, developed countries. Um, I think it's uh, important to uh, consider some changes in the way we, we view um, uh, or we approach certain issues. For instance, the, the mentality should be a bit to uh, come together, work together and build and do things together rather than having uh, dependence type of relationship like it has been um, in some settings in the past. And that would bring uh, very good uh, uh, contributions to everybody and that would bring, uh, would open opportunities for everybody to benefit along the chain, so to say. So to create jobs, to create value chains, to develop industries, to advance research, and the potential is there to do all that. Now, so, thank you, Chloe. I think you have outlined uh, very extensively how, uh, what kind of untapped uh, potentials we have here. Um, and uh, we don't want to chew too much into the public lunch, but uh, I want a final comment from the excellent panel here, how to uh, really point at uh, the track forwards. Veronica. Thank you. Science is uh, a key component of our regulatory decision making as our partnerships. Uh, we do partner with uh, universities in Canada and elsewhere to uh, supplement the scientific expertise that resides uh, within government. Equally important are consumers' uh, expectations and uh, um, uh, Expectations uh, around regulatory decision making, we've touched very lightly on, on that this morning. Uh, I do want to mention that Canada has uh, issued a regulatory proposal to modernize our, our approach to regulating aquaculture in Canada and it's oriented uh, around uh, safety as well as uh, environmental sustainability. So for those of you who have a, an interest, uh, I would urge you to uh, review those regulatory uh, pro proposals because the government will be inviting stakeholder feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Final comment, a few seconds. A few seconds. Okay. Half a minute. I, I think it's important to, to, again, that innovation is more than scientific discoveries and developing new technologies. It's also transferring this technology from the lab into a sustainable business. I think that's a, a very important. And in, in that context, I, I also strongly believe that the big established industry player will be a crucial part of developing the, the blue bio, bio economy. The pull, uh, the pull from the industry. You yeah. need some strong pull, pull forces in order to, to bring this uh, into the marketplace. Claude and George, yeah.
I would just say again that we are facing many challenges in terms of resources to fuel this bioeconomy that we want to, to see uh, uh, rising. And so we should really try and think on how our society could reward improvements in productivity, but in terms of other units that take into account that we are making improvements in lowering uh, the environmental impact, we are more sustainable in our practice. Because as I said, we can grow, but if we do it with the standard, standard practices, it will not be enough. We will destroy our planet. Thank you. Claudia, final. It's okay with you? Yeah. I, I think uh, the State Secretary Dilek stole my manuscript this uh, morning. I mean, it's all about uh, human resources and dialogue and also about joining forces. That's the only way, because the tasks are big, but also the opportunities. So that is also in the spirit of, uh, of my friends here, uh, Pierre and uh, Veronique, with the, the hosting this fantastic uh, event, and also uh, installing this very important uh, new uh, association, Biomarine International Cluster Association, is also in the spirit of joining forces. So thanks a lot to, uh, to the hosts and to the organizers at this uh, excellent panel. Thank you.